2017 attack numbers in Russia uh, showed a significant decrease from previous years. Jane's Terrorism Insurgency Centre's database recorded an 81% decrease in attacks and a similar 80% decrease in fatalities between 2013 and 2017. There are two main drivers behind the significant drops in attacks and fatalities in Russia. The first of these is the significant counter-terrorism operations that have been launched, particularly in the North Caucasus, over the past few years. These started in 2013 ahead of the Winter Olympics in Sochi in 2014 and were further emphasised after the Volgograd suicide attacks in late December 2013. These operations have continued in the region and have had a significant effect in degrading the leadership and capabilities of these militant groups. The second of these drivers uh, is the travelling of over 3,500 fighters to join the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and there have been many more fighters that have joined other groups, particularly in Syria. This has had a significant capability drain, uh, particularly for these groups that we've mentioned in the North Caucasus region. The recent tactical shifts in militancy that we've recorded in Russia have been a shift towards lone actor and low capability attacks, much in a similar vein to Western Europe. Although these attacks continue to be inspired by Islamist groups, we're seeing much less of a centrally directed um, attack pattern for these. The Islamic State has formed an affiliate in the North Caucasus, but this has not led to a substantial uptick in attacks in the region. The group has, however, been able to inspire attacks by lone actors across Russia, but still with a focus within the North Caucasus region. A recent example of this included an attack on a church in Dagestan that killed five worshippers, and more recently in Grozny in Chechnya, where a lone gunman opened fire on police officers. Although both of these attacks were claimed by the Islamic State, only the latter indicated prior knowledge by the group of the attack. The group released a video of the perpetrator showing his allegiance to the Islamic State in claiming responsibility for the Grozny attack. In the Dagestan example, however, the group claimed responsibility but did not provide any further information that was released in media reports. The degradation of militant capabilities has meant that militant actors have had to switch towards more low capability tactics. These include knives, crude IEDs and crude firearms, with a risk in the future of actors also using vehicles, as we've seen in Western Europe. Despite this shift, there is still a residual threat from sophisticated IEDs causing mass casualties, as we saw in the St Petersburg metro attack last year. Returning fighters pose a potentially significant risk to Russia. Of the 3,500 fighters who travelled to Iraq and Syria to join the Islamic State, at least 400 were reported to have returned to Russia as of October 2017. Significant numbers of those who travelled to Iraq and Syria to fight have likely either been killed in combat or have decided to stay and continue their fight with the Islamic State and other groups. Those that have chosen to return to Russia are likely known to security services and will likely be placed under surveillance or arrested at point of return. However, the sheer numbers involved here mean that the security services will find it impossible to try and either detain or keep under surveillance those that have returned. Those that have returned to Russia who decide to continue their militancy will likely be able to fill a vacuum of both capability and leadership in militancy, particularly in the North Caucasus. These fighters have had combat experience and have had training in operating military-grade firearms as well as manufacturing IEDs. Although their return will not mean an uptick in capability in terms of firearms and access to explosives, the knowledge they will pass on to fighters currently in place will pose a significant risk to Russia in the medium term. There are numerous terrorism risks affecting the World Cup. The main one of these, as with the rest of Russia, comes from lone actors with low capabilities. Tactics will likely include knives and vehicle attacks, targeting either fans visiting the games or the surrounding areas. Aspirational targets, though, will include matchday stadia, particularly in Moscow and St. Petersburg, the two cities that will have the largest concentration of foreign visitors, with Moscow hosting the key fixtures of the World Cup including the final and the opening fixture of Russia against Saudi Arabia.
Sochi and Volgograd are two other cities at heightened risk. Their proximity to the North Caucasus means that they are the most logistically viable cities for militants to stage attacks from this volatile area. Whilst the match day stadia will have significant security measures in place, the surrounding areas are therefore at more of a risk. The transport infrastructure in particular is something that militants have targeted in the past and will likely seek to target during this World Cup tournament. As well as these security measures, the additional security forces personnel on the street also present a target opportunity for these actors, as well as the security choke points where large crowds will congregate in queues, as we've seen previously in Volgograd, where a suicide attack targeted a queue of people outside a metal detector at a train station. A heightened security posture will have been in place for the March 2018 presidential elections, as well as following key events, such as the inauguration of President Putin on the 7th of May 2018 and Victory Day commemorations on the 9th of May across the country. Security forces will have used these key events, as well as their previous experiences in securing the Sochi Winter Olympic Games, in ensuring that the World Cup is as secure and unaffected as the Olympics were.